God's wrath. That is a um, strong verbiage. Wrath. It's not even God being upset. It's wrath. And when you and I think of wrath, we think of human wrath. We think of, a, of a, an authority figure that has just lost his self-control and is throwing things around the house and is punching through walls and is kicking everyone, anything that is near them. That's not God's wrath. The book of James says that the, the, the wrath of man does not work the righteousness of God. Meaning that God's wrath produces righteousness too. And God's wrath is not like human wrath. And the Bible speaks of the wrath of God in many places. And yes, there are times in which God does things that are destructive, but always with the restraint of his love, always with the intent of uh, mixing mercy and compassion with these acts of judgment. At the same time, the book of Romans for me is one of the best places to understand the, the wrath of God. Because if we take into kind of compile everything of what we've just read or and studied in the seven trumpets and seven last plagues. The seven trumpets were designed, are designed to arouse humanity out of this spiritual stupor, this spiritual contentment, recognize their great need of the grace of God and respond by coming to Jesus and receiving all the abundant grace God, God, God wants to be bestow on anyone that comes to the Father in the name of Jesus. The seven last plagues, on the other hand, reveal the final outcome of individuals that have for years, for their whole life really, resisted and rejected every invitation of God to be reconciled to, to the Lord of heaven, to receive his mercy and forgiveness, and to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for a transformed life. They just have said no. Flat out, explicit no. Well, the wrath of God is part of, plays part of that picture. And we will see tonight what is the wrath of God or how the Bible describes the wrath of God. Romans 1, 18 through 32, is a very lengthy part of scripture, but one that will enrich and correct if we have a wrong conception of the wrath of God. Paul, right off the bat in verse 18 says, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. There it is. And here's something interesting in the way Paul says it. Paul doesn't say, for the wrath of God will be revealed, but rather present tense is being revealed. So in a sense, the wrath of God will be manifest in a global, universal way at the end of time when the seven last plagues are manifesting on the planet, not to lead humanity into repentance, but to show humanity's refusal to repent and producing within themselves a heart incapable, unwilling, not desirous to, be repent, to repent at the mercy calls of God. And the wrath of God has been manifesting throughout all human history, but it will be manifested in a very um, clear and universal way when all of humanity collectively in the planet reaches a point where they no longer desire and are incapable and unwilling to repent. This is what the wrath of God looks like. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools." and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible men, birds, four-footed animals, and creepy things. Pause. From the first presentation that we had tonight, who, have we just, who has Paul just described when he says that these humans have changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible men and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things? From presentation one, what individual represents this kind of behavior? I heard it. Pharaoh. Egypt. Egypt was full of idols that worshipped the Pharaoh, who was Ra in, in, in the flesh, the sun god. And then the beetles, the alligators, the cats, and all the other four-footed animals. And of course, humans. And that's all pagan religions. Um... So we already see some links to the plagues, God's 
trying to save and Pharaoh and other humans resisting and experiencing the wrath of God. We will see the wrath of God spelled out for us here in these chapters. But I just wanted to highlight that there's elements of everything that we've studied already mixed into this narrative. Therefore, here it is. Because humans have chosen to suppress the truth about God, have changed the glory of God from the incorruptible God to rather worship things that are seen, four-footed creatures and animals and humans. Therefore, God also did what, my friends? God also gave them up to uncleanness. And I'm going to contend with you this evening that this is the wrath of God. This is the playing out of God's wrath. Therefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness in the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves who exchanged the truth of God for the lie implied of God and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator. When you hear Paul describing the wrath of God as God giving them up to uncleanness, How do you visualize that? God giving them up to the uncleanliness of their behaviors, to the unrighteousness of their choices. What does that look like to you in your mind? The choice. God gives humanity choice. And though he gives us multiple abundant choices, if we could quantify it more than we would even deserve, It reaches a point where only God could see this point in each of us as humans. But God recognizes that the heart of a human has reached a point in which no matter how much he pleads for the human to let go of this idol, to let go of this false God that they think think so real, they cling to it with all tenacity and refuse to let it go. Ultimately, when God recognizes like Pharaoh that there is just no way for this person to ever turn back, when that human being reaches that point, God does what? God gives them over. There's a Christian writer that said, right now, we have an opportunity to join Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane and pray like him about our lives, telling God, your will be done. Nevertheless, your will be done. I yield, I surrender to your will, God. But there will reach a point in which God will say to a human that has refused to pray that prayer, your will be done. You want to cling to that? Then I will give you up to what you're choosing. Notice the language. It's not God inflicting, it's God honoring and saying, what you are choosing is what you are, I am surrendering you to because I called and you have refused to answer. This is repeated, by the way. For this reason, Paul continues, God gave them up to vile passions as even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting. Three times, Paul follows up the statement, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth by unrighteousness, who have exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for the, uh, the image of created things and degraded themselves in the process. All forms of idolatry degrade humanity, all of them. We think about, you know, a, well, if we get into specifics, we could spend here all night. All forms of idolatry degrade humanity. For a very simple reason, the Bible history reveals that in the beginning, God made us humans, but he didn't just create us like the rest of creation. God explicitly makes a statement immediately before making us. God makes this statement, let us Make man in our image, in our likeness. Compassion, merciful, considerate, self-sacrificial. That is the only image that makes us human. When we worship animals, 
we worship what we become. And anything outside of God that we worship, we degrade ourselves as humans. Individuals that worship power and wealth, and actually they go hand in hand. People don't want money simply to be able to pay their bills. The reason we want more and more and more money is for power and control, autonomy, autonomy. We don't want anyone telling us what to do. That is self-worship. Because that attitude cannot be contained only in matters of finances. That, like a cancer, metastasizes and spreads like cancer to the rest of the parts of our lives. And eventually, it's not even that my spouse, my parents, or my kids, or anyone else, I do what I want to do. Even God cannot tell me what I need to do. It reaches that point for everyone. All forms of idolatry degrade and destroy us. So when God says he's given us over, it is a heartbroken God. I mean, you want to see a, a picture? We have one in the Gospels of God giving over. The entire city of Jerusalem is a buzz. Everyone has seen the unimaginable, the undeniable. A man by the name of Lazarus after four days of being in the grave, has been called out by Jesus. And word spread, and hundreds, thousands of people are like, before social media, it was by word of mouth, and pretty soon everyone has been told, the Messiah is here. And his disciples hear Jesus say, go into the town and you will find a colt tied there that no one has uh, ridden on before. Bring him out. And the disciples are like, finally, finally, he's going to establish himself as the king. And they put their cloaks on top of the donkey, the colt, and Jesus gets on top of it. And everyone begins to climb the palm trees and ripping down the branches. And everyone's waving them. Hosanna, Hosanna, King of David. Welcome. We were waiting for you. And this procession ends in the most anticlimactic way possible. Not with Jesus declaring himself to be king. Let's go and kill these Romans. Let's become just like them, despots and dictators. Because that, that's what we do, recycle the same thing. And the kingdom of God is nothing like any kingdom on this planet. You want to see what it looks like when God gives over to a group of individuals that refuse to let go of their gods their idols, is at the end of this procession when from the hill that would overlook Jerusalem, Jesus stops the whole procession and begins to sob and cry violently. It's without restraint. His heart is broken. And these words come out of his mouth. O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, that stones the prophets I have sent to you. How often I have desired, like a hen who gathers her chicks beneath her wings, how often I have yearned to bring you to me, but you would not. Your house is left to you desolate. It was with heartbroken tears that Jesus was giving over that generation of leaders that re refused to receive the gift of his salvation. You have been waiting this for millennia, and now that I've come, you're rejecting it. So this is not an experience God yearns nor desires. God wants humans to rather give up their idols and receive his grace. This is why I told you, far from making us a terrified and fearful of a God of wrath, it's revealing that the wrath of God is God's final heartbroken act of saying, I can't but give you, I cannot do nothing more for you. If the cross of my son Jesus Christ is not enough to compel you to surrender what is false, 
what degrades and destroys, what more can I give to awaken you? All unrighteousness, Paul continues, this is what God gives over. All unrighteousness, sexual immorality, which my wife and I talk about that quite often because we have two daughters work, growing up in a world that is becoming more and more like a septic tank at every possible level, but especially targeting children. Wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness. They are whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who knowing the righteous judgment of God that those who practice such things are deserving of what? Not only do the same things, but also approve of those who practice them. This is speaking about those Christian, well, like those unconverted humans that think they're Christian like I was for many years, in which I would have never done the things that I watched on television and called entertainment. That's the closing part of Paul's statement. Who, we know those peop the people that practice these things deserve to die, but it's not that we practice. We may not practice those, but we definitely watch other people doing it. And God says your character is the same. This is the list, and it's not exhaustive, but it's quite broad. This is the list of the things God does not want to give people over to. Can you think of anything in that list that is beneficial, healthy, that allows people to be functional human beings? Can you identify anything that helps build up societies and keep families healthy and growing? Can, you, can anyone identify one thing in that list? Can you identify things in here that destroy homes, destroy families, take away happiness, brings misery, hopelessness, and despair? Can you identify anything on that list that does that? So this is not God capriciously wanting to control our lives and deprive us of things that will actually benefit us in any way, shape, or form. What God is trying to prevent is us from, this is what sin does. Sin makes you think that those things is actually how to have freedom and have joy and contentment and fulfillment. What a delusion, what a lie. Like Pharaoh. He is seeing the plagues. He is seeing the, the magnitude and power and superiority of the God of the Hebrews, but he refuses to acknowledge it. He suppresses the truth about God with unrighteousness, with his pride. Pride will keep millions out of heaven. It's not human trafficking. It's not drug dealing or creating heroin or cocaine in South America and bringing it to North America. It is pride. And all of us have a factory, a little lab in our hearts producing that until we give that, that heart to the Lord. Until we pray, Lord, create in me a clean heart. Create in me something that I cannot. So that list is the life of every human being that does not accept Christ. All the things that we talked about, proud, boasters, uh, disobedient to parents, unmerciful, etc., etc., etc. Let's look at this hypothetical human symbolized by that blue line. Day after day, month after month, year after year, indifference. Indifference towards God. Indifference towards spiritual things. And he's, like I said, he's not doing horrible things. But inside... These things are there. And inside, they're producing that undesirable effect of a gradual, gradual hardening of the heart towards God. And they are things that today you may find repulsive and you would honestly look in the mirror and say to yourself, I would never do that. But beloved, if I harden my heart to God today and tomorrow and next week and next month and next year, 
that which I would think to be inconceivable, reprehensive, abhorrent today to do, in the future I would not. In the future I would not. Individuals that do horrendous things rewind their clock and they come to places in their lives where they they would look at themselves and say, who are you? What have you become? I never thought I would be capable of doing something like this. The teachings of the seven last plague is not designed to scare us of God, but to scare us of the effect of sin, sin that is cherished, sin that is not confessed, sin that is not surrendered by the grace and power of God. It will destroy us. It will separate us from God. Because all of us have a point like Pharaoh in which we harden our heart beyond a point of return. This happens during our lifetime. And every human being that has died has died going in one direction or the other. Some human beings going in the direction of softening and yielding and repenting and confessing and growing closer and closer and closer to the Lord. There are mistakes that we can make along the way, but praise God that if any one of us sin, we have a high priest in Jesus Christ that if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Praise God for those promises, right? But there's another group of humans that are experiencing this, the wrath of God. Paul does not say that the wrath of God is manifested. The book of Revelation says that in the seven last plagues, the wrath of God is complete. Meaning that humanity as a whole, those that have been unrepentant today but could repent, will reach a point that globally we will have Two distinct, extremely, explicitly, openly distinct groups of people, those that have the seal of God in their lives, those that shine like like the, the stars in the darkness, like the book of Daniel says, and those that have become that darkness. Today, you and I find ourselves in two trajectories by choice. My mom would watch me waste my youth in front of the television as a 14 and 15 year old. And I had piano lessons, and I had a Sabbath school that I needed to study. And my mom would say to me, Ariel, you're frying your brain and one day you'll regret that you've wasted these hours. And I hardened my heart towards her voice. Then when the age of relationships came, My parents counseled me in involving myself with individuals that had no spiritual inclinations, no spiritual desires, no commitment to Jesus. And I closed my ears to that voice. And my teenage and young adult life is full of regrets and bumps and wounds and hurts. But by the grace of God, like Jesus says, how how often did I send prophets, uh, plural, God sent my parents, God sent Francisca Williams, Carlos Maldonado. But lastly, and you know of him already, he sent a gentleman, a truck driver by the name of Robert Smith, Bubba. When he spoke, I chose to stop plugging my ear. And I chose to hear what this man had to say to me about relationships, about careers, about success in life. And it was all from a a godly biblical perspective. And the influence of this godly man led me to repentance, led me to confession. It it made me you a U-turn, because that's what repentance means. In Hebrew, shuv means to turn. That's all it means. Repentance in the Bible doesn't mean grovel and and, drool all over your carpet asking God for mercy, no. Repentance is a simple word that means you turn. I was going in one direction, but now I recognize my mind is enlightened. I see it. And because I see it, now I have freedom to make an informed choice. I choose Christ. I choose God. I choose the truth about who God is. I choose his word. I choose prayer like Daniel. Daniel, what do you want? For 30 days, pray to the king and you stay alive. You can pray after 30 days. Daniel said, I want prayer unequivocally, unwaveringly, I want prayer. That doesn't happen overnight. 
It is the cumulative experience of days, months, and years in one determined direction of consistency. A constant, consistent choosing Jesus. I want that. I want that. And my friend, I'm asking you, do you want that in your life? What would you say to me asking you tonight, who wants consistency consistency, and say, I choose Jesus. I choose his word. I choose him. I remember when an evangelist came to Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, this is shortly before Bob and I became really close, making appeals after appeals. And I had, man, I... I wasn't sure. But then he said something that jolted me. He said, you know, for the past several nights, I've been asking you for decisions of, you know, accepting this or accepting that. And I've been asking if you, if you want to make that choice tonight to manifest it either by filling out a piece of paper or raising your hand. And he said, to not choose is to choose. To not choose is to choose. And every choice counts. And just like I could have, at that time, it was almost 30 years of choosing in the wrong direction, one choice in the right direction made it a lot easier to make another choice in the right direction, another choice in the right direction, and next thing I know, my life was going in a different direction by the grace and power of God. God doesn't waste time when he recognizes that there's an awakening in the heart. When he would be preaching and watching the crowds, Jesus would see the faces, and when he would see conviction and a yearning after God, he would address that person. If anyone here is tired, weary, burden, come to me, and I will give you rest. Appealing to the heart. That shuv experience, that turn around experience can happen tonight. It happened to me. I used to be in events like this, feel my heart, oh, then I would go home, turn on the television, and everything would go away. Everything would go away. But by the grace of God, before I met Deline, before I was married, a Saturday night took place in my life, and I cannot tell you exactly when the transition took place. I just remember one night waking up, I mean, not one night night waking up, one Saturday night coming upon me, and I was so giddy, so excited, so full of adrenaline, because me and four other guy friends were going to go to someone's house have Bible study, and of course the pizza was going to be there, but that was not my excitement, the pizza. My excitement that my friends and I were going to start studying the book of Daniel together. They were Bible workers. They also gave Bible studies to other people, but we came to realize, recognize, we need to be fed ourselves. Let's come together and really dig deep. Let's bring concordances and really geek out and be nerds about it. Yes. Beloved, when I was driving to that event, to that place, I was like, whoa, Wow, because I forgot to mention this. Thank you, Lord. Even that shuv experience, even that experience of turning that the Bible calls repentance, even that experience comes from Jesus. <laughs> Jesus sees the desire, and he gives you the power to carry it out. Jesus awakens that desire, and when you say, I want, he gives you the power, because that's what Paul says. He gives you both the desire and both the will and the power to do of his good pleasure. It all comes from Christ. He doesn't force the will, but he honors the desire. This little diagram that I showed you, when a human being reaches and God gives them over, I forgot to mention that, that arrow that ends up crossing God gave them over to their choice of sin. That little diagram, I didn't put that out of thin air. It comes out of the the, uh, account of Genesis. Matthew chapter 24, verse 37, but as the days of Noah were, so also will be the coming of the Son of Man. So also will be the coming of the Son of Man be. As it was in the days of Noah. And in the days of Noah, Noah preached and built for 120 years. But then, Right before the flood, in Genesis 6, 5, it says, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. God said, I will not contend with human beings anymore. 120 more years, and I'm going to have to do something about this human race. When God said those words, this is what humanity was like. Every intent or motives of the thoughts of people's hearts was only evil. 
evil, it's all inclusive, continually. Wake up in the morning, evil. Midday, evil. And it's in the thoughts. And if the thoughts are there, the actions follow. But God was not simply saying, this is what I see externally, is what I see internally. Is the inner pollution has run, has become septic. Has become, sorry, sepsis. Sepsis is when a bacterial infection has just gone all out of hand that is now spreading quickly through the body. It's a very delicate and urgent condition. And these humans were sepsis all over, head to toe. So for 120 years, Noah built the ark. And many people think, and then God sent the flood and destroyed them. It's not how it happened. That line of no return God wanted to show that the same pattern that God will show with the seven last plagues in which he will allow a space in time in which he will show that humanity, if he were to give them more time, they would never repent. He did the exact same thing with the destruction in the flood. Then the Lord said to Noah, come into the ark, you and all your household, because I have seen that you are righteous before me in this generation for after how many days? Seven more days, I will cause it to rain on the earth 40 days and 40 nights. On the very same day that God is saying this, coming to the ark, Noah and his sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and Noah's wife, and the three wives of his sons with them entered the ark, and the Lord shut him in. And when this happened, something supernatural had already taken place to reveal humanity's heart, heart and hearts, and that was the entrance of the animals. Animals do not have freedom like we do, but what a rebuke they are. And God shuts the ark, and everyone goes to bed scared and ominous. Did you see that? I know. Man, I was not expecting that. And then everyone that next day wakes up, and when they look at the sky, guess what they see all over in the sky? Sunshine. And then the second day goes by, and when they look at the heavens, it's birds tweeting, calm and peaceful. And the only odd noises are the animals inside the ark growing restless. By the third day, fourth day, guess what people may have been doing outside the ark? By day number six, it's been six days of Noah being inside this ark. Guess how people are feeling about the ark themselves and Noah? How many people do you think on the sixth day are glad that they didn't go in there and are mocking and ridiculing, completely forgotten what they have seen with the animals? You know why God waited seven days to send the, the flood? To reveal that that generation had reached the point of no return. Had God given them another 120 years, they would never have repented. And then 120 years and 120 years, they would never have repented. But in the process, they would have destroyed and caused human suffering, human destruction, human pain. The flood was an act of mercy to preserve the human family from self-destruction. And it highlights that it lies within my sphere of choosing what my eternal destiny is. And if I am honest with you, I can understand the attractiveness of a theology that says, well, God chooses, so I can just be passive aggressive about my spiritual life. And if God chooses me to be the elect, chances are he did because I am in church. Then it's all his doing and I just cruise along. But a Bible teaching that says, your eternal destiny is in your ability to choose today. Choose you this day whom you will serve. But as for me and my house, we will serve who? The Lord. That was a decision a human being made in real time. But there were other human beings like Korah and Judas and Achan and Ahab that gradually led them down a path in which they reached a point in which God could see no matter how much opportunities and pleadings, their heart is just becoming resistant, harder, harder, harder. 
God hates sin because of what it does to his creatures. He makes their hearts and minds so sick, they destroy others in the process of self-destruction. The gospel is God's power, his grace freely and abundantly offered to humanity to save us from our sins. The seven last plagues are the completion of God's wrath, his tender pleas that have been ignored, his truth that have been suppressed, all the procrastination and excuses have hardened humanity's heart to the point where it is pointless to wait any longer. And God says it is done. That's why that expression is only found at the end of the seven last plagues. It is done. Human history has run its course. There's sufficient evidence of the gospel. There's sufficient evidence about God's character. God's character has been proclaimed and humanity has made his choice. They are by God's grace humans that have chosen Jesus Christ, his grace and his salvation. But there will be other human beings that don't want nothing to do with heaven, God or his grace. Revelation 22, 11 says, he who is unjust. And what is that next word? That is a very powerful three letter word. You know what it tr strongly reveals? Choice. It is the shortened version of what Paul says in Romans, God gave them over. It's the exact same expression. He who is unjust, let him be unjust still. He who is filthy, let him be filthy still. But praise God for the second half. He who is righteous, let him be righteous still. He who is holy, let him be holy still. Praise God for that second half. And tonight, brethren, as I'm preaching, my heart is responding to the voice of the Spirit. Lord, I want that righteousness and holiness. I'm choosing that righteousness and holiness. 1 Samuel 6 makes an appeal to every human being and to you and to me tonight. Why then... Do you what? Harden your heart as who did? And Pharaoh hardened their hearts. The Bible is consistent. The hardening that it speaks about, about God is because God was sending the plagues, but God did not desire Pharaoh to harden his heart. That was his choice. And so Samuel, prophetically speaking, says, why do you do the same? Did you not see their end? Why would you choose the same? Hebrews 3.15 says, Today, if you will hear his voice, do not do what? Do not harden your hearts, as in the rebellion. And Paul continues to emphasize this idea of today. Today. Because today is today, but tomorrow will eventually become today. <laughs> and the day after tomorrow eventually will become Today, I guess when God will call you and, and, and invite you to receive him, to receive his grace and his presence in your life, God will always call you today, which means he will call you again. And then, and what I respond today has an influence on how I respond tomorrow. And how I respond tomorrow has an influence on how I'll respond the following day and the following day and the following day. And people that keep saying, God, not right now. I'm too busy. God, after this. God, I promise you, after this, for sure, you and I, we're going to be like this. Lord, a little bit later, if you just wait, if you just wait, and waiting tomorrow is a fatal mistake because what I'm actually doing by not choosing, I'm choosing. And to choose to not say yes is to choose to say no. And to choose to say no is one movement closer that leads my heart inevitably to have the experience of Pharaoh. You don't have to be Pharaoh to have his experience. Samuel said that. Why do you harden your heart as Pharaoh did? It's a human experience. It's not unique to him because he had power. It's a unique experience to every human being that makes the illogical, unreasonable choice of resisting and rejecting the love of God manifested in Christ and the abundant grace that can save us and make us righteous and holy through the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Why would anyone say no to that? And yes, to idols that fail us miserably. When I was in massage school, I had a roommate who I had a books that... Uh, I had, like I said, you know, TV took a big chunk of my life. It took away my love for reading too. 
But as soon as I got converted, that love was awakened with, with uh, um, fierceness, and I wanted to devour everything I could. There was a book called The Gift of Pain by Dr. Paul Brand, who was uh, the son of a missionary in India. And he also served in India with his wife. He became a world-renowned surgeon specializing in the hand, and his skills were developed in India while working in leprous colonies. And in that book, I highly recommend it. If you like to read, if you're squeamish, I want to warn you, don't read the book. But if you can be okay with blood and guts, then go ahead and read that book. It's a powerful, powerful appeal about embracing our capacity to experience pain. That's what the book is called, The Gift of Pain. And what Dr. Paul Brand discovered was he starts the book by depicting an image he saw when he first arrived at India that compelled him to develop techniques and abilities to protect these people from self-destruction because he saw an older couple sitting by a fire and the older man had only this much of his hand from the wrist just maybe an inch and a half beyond the wrist, a little stub that, that could wiggle a little bit. The rest was gone. He was a leper and so was his wife. And as the couple was warm, they thought they were warming themselves next to the fire. All of a sudden, the woman signaled the man, and the man stuck his little stumpy hand into the fire and removed a potato out from the midst of the fire and had little pieces of amber stuck to his stub. And he goes, <laughs> blew it off. Clearly, protein had denaturized. Stuff had happened that he should have been screaming and hollering because it burned, it hurts but he had a stoic indifference response to the fire in his hands. Because that's what leprosy does. It's a bacteria that some humans do not have the natural immunity to it, and it burrows itself through the pores of our skins, and it houses itself in the sheaths, the nerve sheaths in in our nerve endings, specifically those that deal with pain sensory. And similar to diabetics that develop neuropathy in their feet, lepers affects patches of area in their, in their, their bodies that no longer feel pain. A leper may become blind, not because leprosy gives blindness, but leprosy in the cornea of the eye will lead you to stop feeling the burning pain that causes your body to blink without you even thinking about it. When you were a child, did you ever play that game of the stare game where you stared at each other without blinking to see who could blink, not blink the longest? I played that dumb game. You know, boys are, love those games, you know. And I remember my friends sitting there with tears running down their face. Oh, you're not going to beat me. But eventually, you give in because pain cannot be ignored. But lepers become blind because they no longer feel that it's pain that triggers the blink. Because they don't feel pain anymore, the cornea begins to dry and like a callus that clouds the vision, makes them blind. Dr. Brand describes one of the most horrific experiences I have ever read in medical literature. As he was visiting dif- different leprosoriums throughout India, He was, at this time, a surgeon of renown and respect, and so he was there to teach some techniques and things like that to the in-house surgeons, and they were showing him very specific cases. And there was a gentleman that, though he did not necessarily experience the effects of leprosy, he had a condition that doctors could not identify that led this man to have this. He had complete numbness in every inch of his skin. I don't know if you ever sat on your hip the wrong way and then your feet feel numb or your, your nerves fall asleep in your hand. You, you fall asleep with a shirt that's too tight and the nerves that come down your axillary have been just strangled and then you don't feel it in your fingers too much. It's the numbness. Well, this man had numbness in every part of his body. Also, this condition had led him to have complete deafness. He couldn't hear anything. You could scream in his ear and he could not hear you. And this man had become completely blind. Dr. Brand 
felt it was a mental patient that he was going into the room because all he could hear was screaming and shrieking. And before he could get to the door, the nurse came out there cream, scream, is sobbing and crying, covering her mouth because she was, trying to, she was trying to administer care to this man. This man that could not hear a thing, could not see a thing, could not feel a thing, and yet inside his brain he could tell there was movement around him, but he did not know what was up, what was down, if it was daytime or nighttime. He couldn't tell what was happening, but all of a sudden his arm is moving, and it's the nurse trying to change his clothing, and he's responding violently because he's disoriented. Who's there? Who's there? What is this? Where am I? And when Dr. Brand stood at the door and saw a man immersed in darkness, deafness, blindness, and numbness, became the epitome of Pharaoh and every human, what they will ultimately have in their soul if today we begin the process of resisting and hardening our heart towards God. We will reach a point where our children will plead with us, our parents will plead with us, our grandparents will plead with us, God will plead with us through ministers and family members and church members, and we will be utterly, completely numb to the voice of the Holy Spirit. Today, if you hear his voice, Paul says to do what? To not do what? Do not harden. It is setting your feet in a direction you don't want the final outcome. Why instead not choose to have a more sensitive heart to the voice of God? Why not instead say, Lord, I think it's enough. I think I've said later sufficiently because I hear your voice today Today, I say yes to you. Anyone tonight want to say, Lord, if there's anything that I've been saying to you later, later, tonight, tonight, I have heard your voice. And tonight, I say, today, today. When we yield, this is God's promise to you and me. He promises to sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. God promises to cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your what, my friends? All your idols. And he promises to give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. When we say today, Lord, today, God says, I will take out your stony, stubborn heart and give you a tender, responsive heart. Who wants that tonight? Lord, fulfill that promise in me tonight. I am stubborn. Oh, am I stubborn. Take that out. Give me tenderness towards you. And God promises to put his spirit in us so that we can move us. He can move us to follow and obey his decrees and be careful to keep his laws. There's an old hymn that I will read the lyrics to you. It says, I will follow thee, my Savior, wheresoever my lot may be. Where thou goest, I will follow. Yes, my Lord, I will follow thee. And the refrain says, I will follow thee, my Savior. Thou didst shed thy blood for me. And though all men should forsake thee, by thy grace, I will follow thee. There is a piece of paper that um, I believe Steve will be passing out. I'd like for you guys to take it, pray over what it says. Steve, if I could have one as well. As we close the series and transition to a class in discipleship, there are other things that we've been talking about throughout the series that I want to give an opportunity today for you to say yes to. An opportunity for you to, in a specific, tangible way, say yes to the voice of God. If you hear him today, to say today, I choose you. The piece of paper says, 
I want to respond by this message tonight by, and the first option says, I yield my heart to Jesus. No more excuses, nor delay. Tonight, I accept Jesus as my Savior and my Lord. I will follow Him. If tonight that is a decision you are feeling compelled and awakened to take, my friend, please do not wait. Mark that. The second option says, by God's grace, I yield to accept and follow all the truths of his word, including the keeping of all of God's commandments as a sign that I love my Savior, Jesus Christ. By the way, this invitation to keep in all of God's commandments is the very opposite of that list we read in the book of Romans. The ungrateful, the unmerciful, the sexually immoral, and all those things is the very opposite of God's law. So what you're really responding to is saying, God, make me a functional human being. Make me a blessing to those around us. Why would we not desire that? The third option says, I want to follow Jesus and testify before others through baptism that I follow Jesus. I will. If you mark that, I will contact you and see about beginning a Bible study class with you that will gently and steadily grow you to the point where you are ready to make that decision informed. The fourth one is what I've been mentioning throughout this, both these presentations. I want to be a disciple of Jesus. For those of us that have been baptized and have received him as Lord and Savior, I want to be a disciple, so I would like to enroll in a discipleship class that starts this Wednesday. It will be five weeks, short time. Please mark that if that is something you would desire. And the last, op- the last semital- second to last option says, I want to continue studying the Bible prophecy with someone. And you want this to be personal. If that is something you would want, please mark that. There are individuals that are willing to, to study and gently lead you through the scriptures, to familiarize yourself with the God of love revealed there. And the last one is that there's something in your life that you would like prayer for, something that you feel God needs to take care of, and only he can do this. If you mark anything, please put your name and a way to contact you. And you can fold that paper, and tonight you can give it to Steve, to myself, to uh, Gunther that is up front right here, this young man with a tan uh, hoodie or tank shirt. These are the elders of this church. Um, Pray that all of us would have made at least one decision tonight. So let's pray. Father in heaven, I am so grateful for the teaching of the seven last plagues. Nothing of the sort of a God that has just grown tired and fed up with a stubborn, rebellious humanity. Thank you for your son, Jesus, that in him we can see that wrath revealed in front of Jerusalem, weeping for a humanity that refused to receive him. How often, how often I've desired to gather you, but you would not. Tonight, Father, I am confident if there is anyone that has been resistant, tonight, your spirit has empowered and awakened to say yes to you. I pray for those that are struggling and battling inside, apprehensive of what it means to have a life that follows you. Father, you know, and I'm glad you know, that our hesitancy at times is because we don't trust you. We don't know who you are. So for those that are struggling with that, Lord, unsure of what it means to follow you, I pray that they would at least choose to study about you, that they would at least choose that, that their decision will not be made on based ideas or misinformation, but, Father, that they would recognize that maybe they have not examined the scriptures as they should have or could have. But whatever, Father, it is, tonight every single one of us, today, 
have been inviting to make a decision, a decision to say yes to you. And I pray, Lord, that your spirit, and I am confident your spirit, has led us to that decision and empowered us to say yes. And I pray, Father, that tomorrow, though there will not be music or a sermon, in the quietness of our homes, in the privacy of our hearts, again, we will say yes to you. In Jesus' name, amen.